Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, conservation, access, and enjoyment of the great outdoors. Our guest today is Anitra Hamper. Anitra is an outdoor enthusiast. She's an award-winning freelance journalist and owner of Three Word Press. Anitra, it's a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. This is great. Fantastic. And for our listeners, in my usual spirit of full disclosure, I had the pleasure of meeting Anitra this past month when we were both attending the Outdoor Writers Association of America's annual conference in Casper, Wyoming. And it just loved the fact that she was doing some extreme angling or extreme fishing. I thought that's going to be an interesting episode. And so Anitra, I'm so grateful that you were open to having this conversation with us today. Great. Thank you. Me as well. And it's after spending 20 years working in television news, a lot of people don't believe that I really fish, but I always have. And so it's fun to share that passion. And I appreciate that you are also having this platform for people to, to get outdoors. Fantastic. And I'd like to, if we could just unpack a little bit about your beginnings in, in, in really the outdoor spaces that, you know, was this something you did with family when you were growing up? I did. My grandpa and grandma had a cottage on St. Mary's Lake in Western Ohio. And we grew up going there on the weekends as kids. So grandpa would teach us how to fish, but more than that, he would make me go dig my own night crawlers. And the reward was being able to go fish with him. And so one of my favorite pictures is when I'm four years old and I have a cane pole in one hand and a metal bucket in the other and my pigtails. And I would always go dig worms. And I never learned words at that age, like yucky and ew. And it was, it was an opportunity to be outdoors, to be with my grandpa, to learn how to handle fish, to learn why we care about what's in the water and look at the birds that fly by when we're out doing that to appreciate the water and the nature and the lily pads and everything that goes with it. So it's more than just about the fishing. And I learned that as a young kid. Wow, that is amazing. And by the way, I usually share this towards the end of the episode. My listeners know this is I call myself an opportunistic podcaster. And you mentioned there's a picture of you holding the fish. And uh, so if that's still available, I'd love if we could share that on our show notes, if there's some way to do that. That's fantastic. I, I, I love the idea of kids growing up, going out with the parents, the grandparents. I had an episode we recorded earlier this week and my guest learned how to, I guess what they called hunt or trap and then dress Mm -hmm. rabbits let's just use rabbits but it was with his great grandma it's oh, like wow cool. i mean <laughs> my like cool. yeah i mean my i think on my mom's side my grandfather's family owned a fish market and as i look back doing a lot of this work i think how cool would that have been to kind of hang out at the fish market now growing up in, in western ohio uh these small lakes did you like continue to go fishing and other forms of outdoor adventure just with the family as you were growing up? Mostly it was just visiting the cottage of okay. my parents. And okay. there we learned how to use a rowboat and go with grandpa on a speedboat and set trout lines at night. And I like to claim that I helped him clean the fish, but I was really <laughs> a, a bucket girl. So. Gotcha. Uh, so, but all of my cousins to this day, we're all grown and middle-aged now, I guess. And all of us, there's 10 grandchildren and we all still fish when we get together or we're hiking or we're doing something outside. And all of that stems from that influence. And as you said, sometimes it's it's somebody showing you what to do, but more than that, showing you why, why it it can make a difference, a fundamental difference in your life and how you perceive the outdoors and then what you can get from it. We all know that nature's so so relaxing. And if no one shows you, no one opens that door for you, very few people know what to do with it. They don't yeah. know 
where to hike, how to hike, what to wear to, you know? So I feel fortunate that that just sort of ingrained in me in childhood. I, I just think that is so wonderful. I mean, I grew up just up the road a piece up in Michigan. I grew up in the Detroit suburbs and I went to camp. I suppose at some point in my life, I had a fishing rod in my hand, but I will share today or with any of our other guests and say, I've never been fishing. What? I wouldn't know. I, exactly. I, and so I, I'm thinking now as I'm a part of the, the outdoor space for the podcast, the Outdoor Writers Association, I need to go fishing and it's, I'm going to make that happen. But so you had this love of the outdoors. You have the influence of family. Eventually you went into selected broadcasting and television as your vocation. Did you, did you do any outdoor focused reporting? Because I know you were, you were an anchor and an investigative reporter, but did you like have a dual life here? Like I'm going to do this, this work. And then when I'm off on the weekends, I'm going to go do this work. How'd that work out? No, I just fished on the weekends if I could. Television, television life is all consuming in every way. Yeah. So that was pretty much that career. However, everything that I did then um, enables me to do what I do now. Yeah. Only I'm not, I'm not talking about homicides. I get to talk about fishing in Michigan right. and catching salmon and beaches and things like that. So that was fundamental in terms of what I do now. So that passion has always been there, but I didn't do anything like that on the side from a work standpoint at that time. It's just that when I created my business and I was making plans for what does life after TV look like, I, I wasn't even ready to leave TV. I just made the plans for it on a really bad, long snow day when everybody was in the station for like 24 hours. And I thought, what does that look like? And I developed a business idea that would have one part of it pay the bills and then the other part of it be travel writing that was more the passion than the pay. And so when I shifted gears and I went that direction with my own company, I started doing some travel, doing some travel writing for publications. But every place that I went to, I would stay a day before or after or a few days just to fish. I want to see what's in that water. I want to see how they fish. I want to see what they catch and how they do it. And so I just did that on my own. And eventually I was gathering so many interesting stories and techniques and going to places like Jamaica, where the guy hands me a string and a rusty bolt from his car as the weight to catch fish and things like that, that I wanted to share that expertise. And so Little by little, I started doing fishing writing for different magazines and, and whatnot. So, and then that's just kind of obtained a life of its own. So wow. it's an evolution, really. Yeah, I love this idea of, I, I would call it in a coaching realm, pre-contemplation. It's like, there's this like nagging something going on in us. It's like, I don't really want to do this anymore. We don't know it yet. We don't want to do, have this career, but then there's some other things that are just tugging on me. And it sounds like perhaps there was this pre-contemplation. And then eventually it sounds like you made the, sh the, the full on shift of that was that life. And now I'm going to build another life built around travel and writing and telling stories around outdoor activities like fishing, angling. For sure. And as from the business standpoint, everything that you did, every piece of experience you have, you're building on that. So mm -hmm. what I'm doing now is just an extension of that from a skill set standpoint. I'm right. just applying it in a different way. And my, I, when I redid my website a few years ago, I have the tagline now called Someday Starts Now. Right. And that it, it formulated out of, I guess, a philosophy of when I created my business of do it now, whatever it is, everybody has that someday thing. And I wrote uh, one of my first published stories was a story that the editor titled Someday Starts Now. And it just had such an impact. And the idea is, what is it? We all have it. Someday I want to travel. Someday I want to learn how to do bonsai or play guitar, or someday I want to make a board game, whatever it is, we all have that. And mm -hmm. most of the time it's just living in this someday stratosphere 
and right. we're not doing anything right now towards it. So I always ask people, what are you doing right now towards that? Are you taking a class on Saturdays? Are you, what are you doing? Are you watching YouTube videos on how to do bonsai? Do something right now, no matter how insignificant it might seem, because that's what feeds your passion. Right. So yeah, I think everything is this sort of evolution and on the continuum of our lives. And fortunately, as, as you've experienced as well, you just sort of morph and passion has a funny way of grabbing you that way. So mm -hmm. you have the best laid plans and the travel writing and wasn't even really planning to do outdoor writing. It just happened because when you're passionate about something, it just, it just creates a life of its own. I love that. And I'm a firm believer in learning to recognize, maybe it's about slowing down, listening observing, but recognizing there's something going on here that I need to pay attention to and then perhaps act on. And for you, it, it's that, that was that shift for you. And, mm -hmm. and, and I love it. And the, the fact now you have really just them. I mean, I'm always, there's always a little bit of envy when I, when I interview my guests because traveling here, traveling there. And by the way, I, I totally appreciate when you travel, I'm going to take a couple extra days and explore outdoors. I want to see where the, where the fish, where the folks fishing or doing some hiking, what are some great hikes you can go on? And I finally took a day after our conference in Casper, just to relax. And I, in fact, the picture behind me on my, uh, my on screen is the, is the Oregon trail. I, my, I felt oh, like okay. I had a massage going on the buggy, <laughs> but uh, I'm still sore, but it's like, you, you have to take some time just to also enjoy and observe on mm -hmm. your own terms. And I love that. The projects that you have been working on, you've been all over the world, South America, you've been in Europe, you've been in Asia. What are some of the, the, the favorite? favorite aspects over and above, say, just being able to go out there and do something different. Is there anything else that you would think of as a kind of favorite activity or project to work on that's going to take you in some of these exotic places? Gosh, I think a lot of different projects lend themselves to that. I, For a moment, I was thinking you were asking me some of the, the things that beyond just physically going someplace new, what is it about doing that that's inspiring and in sure. a direction but i was Let's going go to, there well my brain immediately went to the human connection because okay. talking about the outdoors and work and projects but i guess maybe it came into my brain because we live in such a polarized moment and yeah. we forget that that no matter what language you speak or how many thousands of miles you are away everybody shares a smile Everybody shares sarcasm. Everybody shares the same facial expressions. And it's that human connection that is so wonderful to be able to, it's just sort of the sidebar of being able to do whatever projects lend themselves. But if I had to, if I, if I want to talk about projects elsewhere, I guess I would love to, uh, for a while I've been, I've been contemplating the idea of leading women's angling trips. So often I will travel across the world to, to go fishing. And it's usually me and a bunch of guys, which is great. The men that I have worked with have been wonderful. They, they kind of go, oh, great. We're going to babysit at first. Uh -huh. But then when they realize I really do it and I'm really into it, then it's fun. But sure. I, uh, there's so many women who would never do that for exactly that reason. And I thought, what would it look like to create a, a trip for women mm -hmm. that they could go fishing, say, somewhere in South America and learn how to do something really cool, sort of really outside of their comfort zone, which right. I talked about, and but have that environment where they feel safe, comfortable, have that camaraderie, um, be able to learn a little bit about the, the culture and where you are and maybe the food. Mm -hmm. So that's been rolling around in my head because it, it it not only incorporates travel and fishing but the invitation for other women especially who 
aren't like me who won't go and spend a week on a riverbank with five men fishing and being muddy and things like that. And so it's kind of, it's on the radar. It's not mm-hmm. anything that's underway yet, but I think it would be, I think it would be cool. And I think it would be very inviting for, for women who want to do that. Yeah. Something does, I mean, it, it, again, I'm going to circle back to your comment to my initial question. I would think it's got to be pretty cool that you, I would imagine you take your fishing gear, your pole and reel and some fly with you on, on your travel. So let's just say it's just, it's not specifically to do work, but let's just say you're somewhere in Asia or in Europe, there's a, there's a bridge, there's a, a bank and you just head up there and you kind of throw the, put the, put everything together, throw a line in the water. And I would imagine there's probably folks around you like, who is this woman? Why is she here in our space? I would imagine that's a great way to start a conversation and to make new friends. It definitely is. And I'll, and I'll backtrack just a little bit because we have to go fishing. Yeah, <laughs> I've got to take you fishing. We'll, we will work that. It'll be something cool. So I, I do have travel rods. I don't always take them with me because every place is different. Every right waterway, every species, every tackle, every is different. So I like to use, I like this why when I go somewhere new, I like to generally go with a guide so I can see Uh, what do you use? How do you use it? But, but certainly in that realm, yes, it does. It, it definitely opens conversation. And I, it, I say this not being a sexist thing and, and in the same vein of talking about women's trips, but let's face it. I mean, the uh, the outdoor industry and fishing in particular is very male dominated and that mm-hmm. that's really changing it's great to see more women getting involved and kids and mm-hmm. family and but but by and large it really is so it's not uncommon most of the guides that i have in places are men and a lot of times they'll again i get the, what i call the look like great <laughs> going to sort of babysit today. So it does open conversation. And once we get into it and we, you cover a lot of ground when you're in a boat with somebody for like 12 hours. I I was doing some tuna fishing off the coast of Ireland last year. And we were in this little boat for, it was about 12 hours a day for four days in a row. Really? Very extreme rocking, lots of wind, lots of rain. And even the captain couldn't believe that I could tough that out. It wasn't, it was rough. Took a little bit of recovering from that one bit. But I love the conversations that it opens because you learn so much about people. And I don't care who, I don't care if you're a CEO. I don't care if you are a janitor. I don't care if you're a stay-at-home mom. I don't, when you connect with people on a level of passion, none of that, Matt, all of those Things that we sort of hierarchy and jockey for position and things in life just naturally because we're human. None of that matters. You don't know. I've been on, I've been on great trips with some other photography trips that I've been on. And we've got people that have more money than I could ever wish to make and, and the opposite. And nobody knows, like we all are bonded on that level. So what the point that you're talking about is the conversations that it opens are great, just sort of leveling the playing field of life, engaging for a really fun reason. Yeah, I'm curious in some of these trips, uh, use Ireland as an example, you're out there tuna fishing. Did you also come back to shore and actually have a nice meal based on what you caught? That particular trip, it was, we didn't keep the fish. So generally I'll catch and release Unless it is a trip like salmon fishing where we are keeping the meat. So that particular tuna fishing in Ireland is, was part of a conservation program and Ireland just in the last three years has this program underway where they issue about 25 captains permits to tag and release. Like we don't even bring out of the water. We, We tag the fin. They, the captain takes a lot of stats, measuring, doing the weight estimation, get photos and things. We, we don't ever, and you, it's a very tight time frame in from reeling it in, catching it, tagging it off you go because yeah. they've been so overfished. Is this the bluefin tuna? They've been so okay. over that their populations were just decimated off okay. that 
Yeah. So they've just started this program. And so if you catch a fish, if you catch a tuna like we did last year that did not have a tag, we know this is a new one migrating this year. So ah. that's so that so the so over a couple of years, they're monitoring these numbers and seeing, oh, our populations are coming back. So it was so in that particular instance, it was it was for that that program. But I did go fishing in Michigan last weekend and well, all of last week really, but and I do have a freezer full of amazing salmon. <laughs> yes. I love it. A nice okay. out of that. So yeah. it just <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I asked that because I'm thinking about traveling. I'm a foodie. I'm a photographer. And so I love off the beaten track to go take some pictures, just hang out, do dark sky photography, or go to the farmer's markets or one of my favorite things outside of when I'm traveling. And just thinking about the, the inspiration people get. And do you, do you see the work you're doing? And you kind of alluded to it that, if you can do it, there's no, and they see your video, your story, whether it's on YouTube or on your website, a book, do you find that more and more people are going beyond, oh, I wish I could do that to how can I do that? Mm, that's an interesting question. I think so. I think COVID pushed a lot of people to do that. Yeah. I like to think so. In TV, in TV land, we, we, our whole world in telling stories is is about connecting with the audience and making it relevant. So everything that I do now is is for that reason. In the selfie world that we live in, it's not like, oh, look where I got to go. It's right. about, here's where I went. You can go here too. And look at all the cool things you can do. And here's how you can do them. So I, I like to believe that people are wanting to add that fabric to their lives and in, in asking, how can I do that? But at the same time, I say that there's so many people that I do also hear from and say, oh, I, I could never do that. Or mm -hmm. I would never do that. There's so many people that I know that haven't even been out of Westerville, Ohio, a suburb of Columbus. So I, I don't really know where we land on that. I like to hope that people are wanting to do more of those things and asking those questions. Sure. In your travels, and I, I mean, not everything is going to be blue sky and, war, and warm breezes and, and kind of adult beverages with the little parasols <laughs> on them, whatever they're called. I mentioned kind of travel is hard, especially if you are a travel writer. Any experiences that maybe stretched you just a little bit, like maybe you were beyond your comfort zone and you had to perhaps overcome some adversity or challenge? Yeah, it, it, I think there's always an element of that, no matter where you travel. You can go to Florida and have to deal with things that sort of push you over your yeah. comfort level. By and large, the I would say probably nothing could ever top the experience that I had being trapped in India when COVID happened. Um, really? I was there for two assignments and never made it to the rivers I was supposed to get to and ended up hiding on a mountainside in a fishing camp on a terrace. We've seen the terraces in Asia. It was on the, in the Himalayan foothills, right on the border with Nepal, very remote. I was with my fishing guide at the time and the, the Indian folks, the locals, and they were all being told unbeknownst to us that it was too hot there for this mystery death virus that was, we're hearing about to even come. Right. And that foreigners would bring it. So mm. we we didn't have that message until yeah. a foreigners translated what was being said on the news. And it became a very hostile environment. And we were targeted with rocks thrown at our car, villagers threatening us, police threatening us. And then when the country locked down, we had no way to get out at all. Oh, wow. Our friend at the fishing camp said, you come hide here. And we did for about five or six weeks and under really terrible conditions. Once our food and water started getting low, that was pretty dire. I made a, a gym out of rocks <laughs> and I would spend some of the days just carving wood to keep my brain busy because we were under constant threat by the authorities, by the locals, 
targeted and we were literally hiding in the mountains for five or six weeks. And so eventually when the embassy, it was my journalist friends that were the ones that helped make the inroads to the, the embassy. The embassy was like, we can't help you. And I had no, almost no communication. So that complicated things. My journalist friends helped connect to the embassy. There was a, a incredible organization called the Committee to Protect Journalists that you might have heard of. They help journalists in dire situations who are in war zones and imprisoned and very extreme. And so they got involved and the Knight Foundation got involved to get us out. We did eventually get out, but not before we were branded with chemical burning ink on our hands. Oh, wow. The authorities. So I would say there's not, I can't think of a situation in the world I certainly hope nothing worse than that would ever happen, but that was, that was challenging to, to be in a situation where there was, I've never felt that desperation of no hope. I, I can't, I can't go. I'm stuck. It's like being a mouse in a box and being taunted. I mean, you're trapped and being taunted and you just stuck. So I, I would most people are not going to face that kind of fear or adversity in travel, but we live in a world that is just very unpredictable now. Right now. Um, and at this, I say that and people say, oh my gosh, one of the first things that I did, HBO interviewed me for a documentary that they're doing about endangered journalists. And I, in that interview, I said, I don't want what happened to me to be an excuse for people to say, ha ha. See, it is dangerous to go to India. It is dangerous to go to Africa. And I don't want that to be the case because we have it bad here. And so while that was an adverse situation, I, I, I never want it to be to reinforce. So many people say, aren't you scared when you travel? And I said, no, but yeah, so, but you will always have challenges. And right. most of the time, that's part of the fun. Most of the time I go, you know what? That's going to be really funny, like a, a long time from now. <laughs> but yeah, so you're always going to have those things. Yeah. Wow. That's, I mean, that's an incredible story. And I, I just think you're right. There's so many things going on in this world now. And who could have predicted like Ukraine? Who could have oh, predicted right. COVID? And I, yeah, I remember in 2019, there was some inkling of things happening in China, but, but uh, your story, and I'm sure there are uh, some others where people just, they're like, they're alone and what do you do? And I think this is where friendships and relationships that you spoke to earlier are so important that we have to be open to getting out of our comfort zone, not only to accomplish things that are of interest to us, but also an opportunity to realize there's a whole world out there. We have a responsibility to develop relationships and positive relationships and make a difference with other people. And so really, I appreciate you sharing that story. I'm, I'm sure that was not easy, but I, I do appreciate that. I, I am curious, speaking on a more global perspective, I mean, with your travels and th talking about the story in, in Ireland and, and tagging the, the, the tuna, what's the perception of conservation Glo two questions globally because you're you travel enough there's other views of conservation what are, what are people doing do they do they see there's value in it and i'm also curious how fishers fisher folks that fish and, and, are, and anglers how what's their perspective on the work we are doing in conservation, do they, because I see them as an important part of conservation mm -hmm. and maybe we don't give enough credit to that. So two questions there. Okay. Sure. I, I think, I think definitely globally, we are on a high level, more conscious and more aware and care more about our individual impact on conservation and why we should care about it even myself. I mean, a few years ago, it's just another somebody else's issue. And now we're seeing the real effects of things being depleted. And like the, the tuna, when I saw that tuna up close, it brought it home to me in what we were doing. These 
incredible creatures, these top predators of the sea, these beautiful animals and where their place is. And, and wow, we're doing something to, to protect this. So it seems like conservation, we, we hear a lot of the rhetoric and it seems unreachable to us. And so I'm hoping that people are becoming more aware of trees, fish, water, the sky, the air, and certainly things happening like the heat wave we're having suddenly brings those conversations home in some way. So in whatever way it becomes relevant to you, it's, I think it's definitely becoming more, people care more, I think, and doing more and realizing, hmm, where do I fit into this picture? And so, yeah, I think globally, we are, for the most part, trying to make good, good strides towards that. And there's certainly a lot more work to do. Okay. And, and locally here with, with folks at Fish and the, and the anglers, it's funny because I, well, I'm going to have this call with you and I want to say fishermen versus fisherwomen, <laughs> but, and I'm going to, I'm going to keep that into the video, by the way, I'm not editing that out, but yeah. anglers, what yeah. what's the because you interact with so many of them, I mean, your recent trip where you were went out and caught salmon, which by the way, that looked like a lot of fun on the, on the YouTube that you shared. What's the perception of the, these folks that you're going out with day in, day out on your projects and mm -hmm. adventures? What's their perception of their role in conservation and the environment? And I think that's an important point to bring up. And I'm glad that you did because people who don't fish. I think look at anglers like, oh, you're fishing and you're just, you're, they don't know about it. But the, the most angler, the reason they're doing it is because they do care about the populations. Lake Erie, where I was salmon, fi salmon fishing last week, they, they created a whole industry around salmon fishing, but they did it to, well, to create a, a fishery, but they also did it for conservation. So and fishing, one, helps populations keep in balance. And they're always monitored. States do a great job at that. But at the same time, down to the efforts of anglers and the hooks that they use, many anglers will no longer use hooks with barbs on them, right? So you can take the hook out very easily. The, the types of equipment handling is such a big topic right now in the fishing industry. How you're handling the fish. Um, you know, how you're holding it, how you keep how, what you're doing. When I was fishing for the Wells catfish in Spain, we'd get it out and get a photo, but somebody was keeping it wet with buckets of water constantly. So it, the careful handling, getting it back. And then you're going to have the argument of why take it out anyway? Why fish period? How is that? How is fishing or sport fishing helping conservation? And I think my answer to that is, by fishing, it gives me an opportunity to see what's in there. It gives conservationists and biologists an opportunity to see what's in that body of water. How many of those do we have left? How, what is that thing we just discovered? We don't know what's in there unless we fish for it. So if you are somewhere like I was in India on the Mahakali River, which few people will ever get to in their lifetime, it is the place in the world to fish for the golden masir, this beautiful, long, golden fish that I would say, if you know what a carp looks like, it looks like a giant, beautiful carp. <laughs> and, and we'd never know that that was there. We'd never know there, there is a conservation program in place for the golden masir, but you've got to fish for those things to see what's in there. And I think what an amazing opportunity to get that close to creatures we would never see if we didn't fish. And when we see it, we connect to it, we care about it, we want to protect it. And I think all of that has value. So while we're doing that, anglers are also taking steps to, okay, we want to do that. So let's do that safely and let's teach people how to do it properly. Oh, I love that. And it's, it's a perfect uh, explanation. So I think for that little segment, that's a wrap. That's good. 
thinking about your 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 path forward now, Anitra, your career. I mean, you you have three WordPress. Uh, there's a lot of aspects to the work that you're doing. How do you see your career continuing to evolve in the coming years? Any thoughts on that? It's just sort of taken on a life of its own. I I truly enjoy the travel writing. Okay. I still love doing the corporate content work, content strategy. I still do production work. I, I still do those things, but, but now I have a cool matrix of things. So I can be typical week. I can be fishing and gooey one day in a boat. And then the next day I can be shooting a commercial. And then the next day I could be working on a story. And then the next day I can be giving a course on how to work with the media. And so I, I would say that it's a, it's a matrix of things that continues to evolve and develop and always okay. come out of the, out, out of left field and you go, huh? Okay. That's cool. So I would say I just want to continue to grow that and continue to look for new opportunities that maybe I haven't thought about. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Is there a, a place that is on your wish list that I need to get there. Any place in particular? I was just talking to someone today about Australia. Ah. I've never been. It's high on my list. It's so big. Where do you start, right? Uh, have you been there? I have been there once. I used the term opportunistic earlier. I, <laughs> I opportunistically follow some friends of mine and they lived in Brisbane. And so I visited them there for three weeks. It was wonderful, but uh, there's, it's such a big country and it's like, you need a lot of time or, or visit a lot. Exactly. That's what my parents did. They went several times, but I, Australia is high on my list. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, there's a lot of places in. Do you uh, dive? Do you dive? I don't. I love to snorkel though. I was going to get my diver's permit, but you know, I'm just such a child of Jaws and I just I just don't know how I, how I might react well, <laughs> and I, I, panic. <laughs> yeah, I get that. And I, if, if you do go, I would make at least a point to go to the Great Barrier Reef, to Canes. And it's uh, talk about environmental devastation. It's the, the, the corals there are just, they're heavily impacted by the, the changes in our weather and the temperature. And, no. but the, they were something to see. This was, I don't know, 15 years ago, perhaps, but yeah. So you got to go do it, do okay. it. Just do I would it. love that. <laughs> All right. Just curious too. Now in the, in the work that you're doing and like the activities with, for example, like the outdoor writers association of America, that's how we met and what brought you to, to that, that meeting? Our executive director is a, a buddy of mine from the travel right. space okay. and Oh gosh, for more than a year, he's told me that I really need to be in this. He called it my tribe. People that are in the outdoor space that are just really outdoor minded like I am. And so in part because nothing was moving, no one was moving because of COVID and like everybody was home. It, it, it just this spring, I thought, gosh, things are moving again. And it would be great to connect with people in, in mm -hmm. the outdoor space. And so yeah, I, I took the opportunity to go and I'm so glad that I did. I've just great. really is cool to be with that really close knit group of people who are really passionate about the same thing. I, I, I totally empathize with that. Exactly. Before we head out, there's a couple of segments in a show that we present uh, to our, to our guests. And I, I find it benefits also our listeners. One is what we call the aha moment when you kind of look back perhaps at your career, life's a journey, and you kind of look back and say something that's pretty amazing, or this is going to really have an impact somewhere, somehow. What would be your aha moment as you look back and what you've accomplished? Um, I honestly, I can't remember what I had shared with you previously, but I, but I, I would say by large, what sticks out to me is the impact that I can have on somebody else. I love it when somebody says, wow, that fishing thing or that place, I went to check that out. And man, it was, it was great. 
when I have been able to gently impact the experience that somebody else has been able to have something that's brand new to them. So mm -hmm. I think, I think there's a lot of those aha moments on that level, certainly on a professional level, there's plenty, but those are the ones that mean more to me is when you can impact somebody else in a positive way. Okay. Fair enough. Love it. And an, another kind of component is what we call the insight to go is as we kind of get to a close towards today's episode and any final thoughts it could be a quote, philosophy, book, article that you would like to leave with our listeners to really shed some light on the importance of the work that you're doing or perhaps how, how your journey can be used as a, as a vehicle for someone else and anything you'd like to share? Yeah. And I think I've shared this with you. I keep this little quote. Oh my gosh. I've had it for ages stuck to my refrigerator. And the quote is always be more than you appear and never appear to be more than you are. And this quote had been passed down from Gail King, from Bono, from Angela Merkel, and from her father. And there was just something about that quote in some magazine. I mean, I might've even had this in college just a long time ago right. that, that resonated. And I think that's so important now because look, I was on TV for 20 years. So it was never about being on TV. It was about the journalism. And we live in this space now where it's just people try to show their, you know, living their best life on Facebook or social media when they're just dying inside of depression or they, everybody wants to be more than they really are. And I think this is so important because when you flip that on its head, you're, you're far happier, you're far more productive, you're far more successful and you're far more humble. And I, I think that's important no matter what industry you're in. Yeah. As you were reading that quote and sharing this insight, the, a book by Patrick Lencioni from the table group, he wrote a book called the, the five dysfunctions of a team, very mm -hmm. big on team coaching, team development, but one of his follow-up books and the books are built around a, a fable is called the ideal team player. And that's being humble, hungry, and smart. Mm -hmm. And. I, as you were saying that, I was thinking that kind of fits Anitra. She's very humble, definitely very hungry because there's, there's a lot to, of opportunities out there. You want to continue to explore and develop yourself, but also smart in terms of the people and the impact that you're having on them. And again, if you can make a difference through your work, that's, it doesn't get any better than that. Cause we can look back at the end of the day, the week, the year and say, Wow, that's great. Right. Look what these people are doing because of maybe some little thing that I did. So I love that. Thank you. Before we do head out, I, again, I'm an opportunistic podcaster. If there's some photos in addition to you as a little girl holding on to the fish, would love to share a couple on our website, on the Outdoor Adventure Series website. If you're open to that, we could talk about that if that's okay for you. Yeah, that's great. That's perfect. Fantastic. Oh, it, it, something, there's one last question. On the website, on Facebook, Instagram, you are sometimes holding these massive fish. How, and I know it's probably just for a split second, maybe somebody's below the frame ready to catch it. How big are these fish that you're holding? How heavy are they? Some of them pretty heavy. They're the Wells catfish in Spain. I had to sit down and and it just basically laid on me, and we had to do the photo very quickly. The those were about 150 pounds and oh seven feet long, so in every way bigger than me. Like I could crawl into it like a sleeping bag if I wanted to, but you know. And 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 it's funny. So yeah, I will send you some photos. And I remember as a little girl learning to fish thinking, man, someday I want to catch our childish wishes. I want to catch a fish as big as me. Like what's the <laughs> biggest one I can catch. And the night I caught the first wells that big, it was oddly emotional for me. I had gone back to my apartment around midnight after catching that. And I just broke down. I thought if my grandfather could see this, 
how amazing. And it's like at that moment, everything came full circle. It was like that little girl caught a fish as big as her. And it was just really neat. So yeah, I'll, I'll share those photos with you. But but yeah, the fish, like the salmon, I caught a 25 pounder and they get pretty heavy. Yeah, so, I, I could yeah, imagine. I, I love it. I love it. Before we head out, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where's the best places for them to go? Start with my website, three wordpress.com. And then I am on social media, Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. We'll, we'll provide the backlinks to the website at three wordpress and then your social sites, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, et cetera. Anitra, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. It's the, I think I said this is going to be about a 30 minute podcast. We're actually heading right into 50 minutes. So, oh gosh, uh, this is great. <laughs> so, hopefully, I haven't messed up your schedule any. No, but not it, at all. But it's been a pleasure to to just kind of learn more about you, your work, what your passion has been, your your background, just some great stories, and just uh, this is what I love to give to to our listeners. Just to again, if it gets them out the door to explore to try something new, then you know the, I've met the goal in that respect, and I've done it with your assistance as well. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Fantastic. Listen, I need you to stay on the line. We're going to do a quick close and you and I can have a final chat. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, folks. What an episode chatting with Anitra Hamper. She's an outdoor enthusiast, freelance journalist, and owner of Three Word Press. Really just, we, we actually touched a lot of ground today. Her background, learning how to fish in Ohio with her grandpa and you know, continuing that love of just getting outdoors, spending time with family, fishing when they all get together and kind of the trajectory through her career as a journalist and, and going on to create this new life, which is built around telling stories and especially in the outdoor space and her love of, of angling and really perhaps even uh, helping others, perhaps other folks just like me who have never fished to other women who perhaps said, I can't do that. But, you know, something sometimes here, like in Las Vegas, when we do go out to Red Rock National Conservation Area, there's a little scenic route. And that scenic route is, it's easy. Everybody can do it. But sometimes you got to get off the scenic route and take a new path. And really, this conversation is really an opportunity for folks who are thinking about getting off the, the easy path, the comfort zone, and try something new because something life is too short and we really have to go out and really be our, be our best selves, but also to be happy and to make a difference. And we hope, hopefully, you will have picked that up from today's episode with Anitra as well. Now, you can find this episode on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast, our webpage, OutdoorAdventureSeries.com. We're also on LinkedIn and Facebook on our Outdoor Adventure Series pages. And you can find us on YouTube and as well as the podcast directory. So wherever you get your podcast, just search out Outdoor Adventure Series, like it, share it, comment on it, and again, just enjoy yourself. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day, and we will see you on a future episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Take care now.